Good evening. My name is Sam Ramez. I'm a Kevin B. Harrington student ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at St. Anselm College and the Amherst Institute of Politics, I'd like to welcome you to, to, uh, to tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages and uh, to actually participate uh, in, political life of the, in the political life of their communities and strengthen the democracy. The Institute is not partisan, does not support any candidates or political issues. Before we begin tonight's event, I'd ask you to turn off any of your, any of your cell phones or other devices that make noise. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Mark R. Cheatham, who is a native of Cleveland, Tennessee. He earned his BA in history from Cumberland University, his MA in history from Middle Tennessee State University, and his PhD in history from Mississippi State University. Uh, after teaching at Mississippi State University for Women in Mississippi State, he moved to Manchester, New Hampshire in 2004. He served as assistant professor of history at Southern New Hampshire University, and in 2008, Dr. Sheedham returned to his alma mater of Cumberland University as an associate professor of history, and also served as director of the history program. Dr. Cheatham has, uh, has written several books, including Andrew Jackson and the Rise of the Democrats, Andrew Jackson, Southerner, which won the 2013 Tennessee uh, History Book Award. He is currently completing two books, The Log Cabin, Hard Cider, The Hard Cider Campaign of 1840, Politics as Entertainment, Antebellum America, and The Dark Horse Campaign of 1844, Slavery, Westward Expansion of, of Presidential Politics, which will be included in the next volume of the University Press of Kansas, American Presidential Election Series. He's also the chief editor of the new documentary, uh, The Papers of Martin Van Buren. Tonight, Dr. Sheen will be joining us for the discussion titled Partisan Mudsliding in the 1828 presidential campaign. He'll discuss the battle between President John Quincy Adams and President, uh, Andrew, the challenger Andrew Jackson, the effect it had on Jackson's presidency, and the future of American political party system. Following Dr. Cheatham's uh, remarks, we'll have a brief question and answer period. Please wait until a student pass with the microphone reaches you before beginning your question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mark R. Cheatham. It is such a great privilege to be here tonight. This is my first return to New Hampshire since we left in 08. And I was telling Andy Moore, my friend, as we, as I was driving in from the airport, I actually became a little bit emotional, uh, which is unusual for me. Um, but it is a privilege to be here, and I thank you for, for hosting me. Um, this is a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. My students think that I love Andrew Jackson. Um, I do not, I will assure you of that. Um, but I do think he's a very complex and uh, important and interesting part of our US history. And so I wanna talk about the 1828 election. And I want to start by reminding us that modern day campaigns have had their share of political scandals, as you all are probably well familiar with. Um, I identified three here, the three most recent presidents and some of the uh, challenges that they faced uh, during their campaigns. We can certainly go back before uh, President Obama and President George W. Bush and President Clinton and find other scandals that came up during campaigns. Um, so I want you to understand that, that scandals during campaigns are not unusual. Uh, I would say, however, that the 1828 campaign is unusual in one regard, and that is in the very personal, vindictive um, nature of the attacks. And so what I want to spend the next few minutes doing is talking about some of the attacks from both the Adams campaign and the Jackson campaign. Uh, unfortunately for Jackson, there are far more from the Adams side than from his side. Um, and then look at what importance they have for Jackson and then uh, end our time with reference to sort of, I think, what we can learn from this topic. So just to refresh your memory, because uh, well, if you're like my students, you may not remember all the political history of the early republic, Andrew Jackson ran for the presidency in 1824, and he lost, and he lost to John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams would serve one term as president from 1825 to 1829. He was a, I think most historians would say he was a very ineffective president. And certainly during the 1828 campaign, Jacksonians tried to uh, present him as a very ineffective president. 
So there were a couple of things that Jacksonians focused on when they talked about Adams during the 28 campaign. And one of the attacks that they levied against Adams was his gambling, his purchase of gambling devices and the attendant corruption that supposedly was associated with the purchase of these devices. And you'll see, the, one of these, uh, the chess set, did belong to John Quincy Adams, the billiard table did not. But both of these were, were games that uh, Adams purchased during his time as president. They were purchased out of his own pocket. Yet, Jacksonians attacked the purchase of these two games as something that said uh, something very much about Adams. And what they said about Adams was, number one, he supported gambling. Which was ironic, given the fact that Jackson had made a name for himself when he was growing up as a gambler. And in fact, by the time he was president, and even after his presidency, he was very much involved in gambling via horse racing. Right? Politicians are not always consistent. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> and then there's the chess set, which, as a chess player myself, seems quite odd. Uh, but people do gamble on chess games. Um, but both of these purchases said something about Adams, that he supported this, this, this gambling vice, and that he also used the people's money to purchase the games. Again, in reality, he used his own money. But Jacksonians were looking for things to attack Adams about. The other thing, the other minor thing that Jacksonians attacked Adams about was his pimping for the Tsar of Russia. Now, I don't encourage you to Google that, because I did, looking for some picture that would sort of encapsulate and capture your attention. Uh, don't, don't recommend that you do that. But there was a Jacksonian attack against Adams that claimed that while he was serving as ambassador to Russia, he procured prostitutes for the Tsar. Now, the reality is, it was nothing like that. But, again, Jacksonians were not always... Um, <laughs> careful about what they attacked Adams about. The major issue that Jacksonians attacked President Adams about was the corrupt bargain. During the 1824 campaign, Andrew Jackson had won a plurality of the electoral votes. He had won the most popular votes, he had won the most states. But as you all know, because you're good, political historians or political scientists or political students, you know that the only thing that matters in the United States is the Electoral College. Jackson had not won the majority. And so in that case, the top three vote-getters had their names submitted to the House of Representatives. In this case, it was Andrew Jackson, it was John Quincy Adams, and it was William Henry Crawford. Now Crawford had a problem. He had suffered a stroke or an illness of some sort the previous year, which had almost killed him, had left him virtually incapacitated throughout the campaign. And so he was someone who realistically was not going to be an option as the next president. So the two only choices that representatives had were Adams and Jackson. But there was a third person who was involved in the House election, and that person was Henry Clay, who was Speaker of the House. Henry Clay had also run for the presidency in 1824. He had come in fourth, which I'm sure irked him quite a bit because as Speaker of the House, if his name had been one of the top three, he very likely would have become president, or he certainly would have tried very, very hard to manipulate it to the result. But in any case, Clay is not one of the top three. So the House election comes down to essentially Jackson versus Adams with Crawford kind of a, a minor figure in the election. But Henry Clay, as Speaker of the House, determined that he wanted John Quincy Adams to become president. Now, as a political historian of this era, I can tell you there is no smoking gun. There are no White House tapes. There, there's nothing firm that suggests that. There are hints at the negotiations that took place between Adams and Clay, however. There's a notation in Adams' diary in which he notes that he and Clay met prior to the House election and discuss some very serious matters, and he leaves it at that. So as political historians, we, we fill in the gaps because of what happens as a result of the House election. And what happens is that some of the states whose electoral votes had gone to Andrew Jackson 
cast their sole vote in the House election for John Quincy Adams. And they do so, Jacksonian to believe at least, because Henry Clay had manipulated the results in Adams' favor. And Jackson is furious about this, as you can imagine. If you know anything about Andrew Jackson, and you'll learn more about him as we go along, Jackson has a bit of a temper. Um, and when he gets riled up, he tends to let people know what he thinks about them. And in this case, he writes letters to constituents and to friends back in Tennessee, telling them exactly what he thinks about Henry Clay in particular. Because he lays a lot of the blame for this loss on Henry Clay. And that's one of the striking things about the 1828 campaign, is that Jackson spends a lot of time talking about Clay more frankly than he does talking about John Quincy Adams. Now his campaign managers and his campaign supporters do focus on Adams. They focus on his uh, policies and his presidential politics. But Adam, I'm sorry, Jackson himself personally writes about uh, Henry Clay. So in any case, what convinces Jackson and his supporters that Clay was behind this, this vote was the fact that shortly after Adams wins the House election, he appoints Henry Clay to be Secretary of State. And this is where Jackson makes his famous quote about Clay being the Judas of the West, that he had betrayed the presidency and he betrayed the people by supporting Adams in a way that the votes, the, the, the general election, had indicated that the people did not want to see as a result. So in any case, Jackson, who quite frankly had not been all that keen on running for the presidency in 1824 to start with, and who even as late as January and February of 1825 in his private correspondence actually doesn't appear to be all that interested in winning the election. Um, he, he says frequently that he just wants to go back home to Middle Tennessee, retire to the Hermitage, his plantation, and live with his wife, Rachel. But once the House election is decided, and once Clay and Adams, according to Jackson, have struck this corrupt bargain, he's determined that he is going to defeat Jackson, uh, he's going to defeat Adams in 1828. And so Jackson commits himself by the late summer of 1825 to running against Adams in the next presidential cycle. This campaign poster gives you some indication of the tactics taken by the Jacksonian campaign, and it's difficult for you to read, probably, at the distance that you're at. But essentially, it takes the old story about the house that Jack built and turns it into the house that uh, Jackson is going to build, and it labels Daniel Webster and Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams and various other people as sort of the rats uh, who have taken over Washington, and Jackson is going to come in and he's going to sweep out these rats, and he's going to put into place a government and a presidency that's supported by the people. And this is really the Jacksonians' campaign tactic in 1828. Yes, they talk about Adams, and they try to focus on these issues in Adams' private life, billiard table and so on. But in reality, what they're focusing on is the fact that they believe that Adams and Clay stole the election from the people in 1824-25. And that is really their mantra throughout the 1828 campaign, giving the people back the government, giving the people back the presidency. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, unfortunately for Jackson, um, there are a number of issues that the Adams campaign can focus on to attack Jackson and he's going to have to fight off a bevy of these issues. One of the major issues that social historians in particular have paid attention to, and political historians have now interwoven into their histories, is the attack on the Jackson marriage. So let me give you a little bit of the background. When Jackson moved to Middle Tennessee in the late 1780s, he was a 21-year-old lawyer. He moved to Nashville and moved in with a woman by the name of Donaldson. It was the widow Donaldson. She was the widow of one of the co-founders of Nashville, Tennessee. Living in the widow Donaldson's home was her married daughter, Rachel Donaldson Robart. Rachel's husband, Lewis, was not happy with the relationship that Andrew and his wife, Rachel, had with one another. It appears that they had an emotional intimacy almost right off of the bat. Whether there was anything more than that, we simply don't know. 
In any case, Lewis was a very jealous husband, and by all accounts, Rachel was a very flirtatious wife. You add in a third personality, Andrew Jackson, who even at that point, at, at that young age, had a big personality, and this is a very toxic relationship underneath the Widow Donaldson's home. And I warn my students, uh, a jealous partner, uh, a flirtatious partner, and a third party never adds up to anything good. Right? So in any case, Lewis Robarts became so consumed with jealousy, whether it's just simply perceived jealousy or real jealousy uh, based on reality, that he abandons Rachel, and that plays right into Jackson's hands. He and Rachel go down to Natchez, which was in Spanish territory, it's now in Mississippi. When they come back, they proclaim themselves married, and they live in that regard for the next couple of years until word reaches Nashville that Lewis Robards had just been granted a divorce from his wife, Rachel. Now, you could do the calculation. If two years later, Robards is just getting the divorce, then that means that Andrew Jackson was an adulterer and his wife, or his supposed wife, was a bigamist. This does not go well. Uh, Jackson is in a fury about this. You know, how could this have happened? By the way, as a lawyer, he should have known exactly how this could have happened. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that he did. There are some historians who have defended him, but I think he very clearly knew what had happened. In any case, he and Rachel marry in 1794, and frankly, if Jackson had never become president, this probably would not have become an issue, or if he had not run for the presidency, it would not have become an issue. But he does. He runs for the presidency. During the 24 election, there are some private rumors that, uh, about the Jackson marriage that leads to some questions, but it really doesn't become a public issue until the 28 campaign. During the 28 campaign, the Adams campaign focuses on the Jackson marriage, focuses on the fact that Rachel had been a bigamist, focuses on the fact that Jackson had married, had taken up with and had married a scorned woman, had, had taken up with an impure woman. And how can we elect someone like that to the presidency? And Jackson's campaign managers, the men closest to him, have to restrain him, I'm sure physically at times, from writing letters and writing editorials defending Rachel, defending the marriage. They tell him, actually, let us do that by proxy. We'll write the editorials. We'll form, a, we'll form a committee. We'll get depositions that attest to Rachel's virtue and attest to the fact that you had no clue that she had not been divorced. So this is a, an issue that percolates during the 28 campaign. Once Jackson becomes president, Rachel had died in December of 28. Once he becomes president, this marriage will become a major issue for Jackson because he has to deal with a sex scandal that I think, uh, as he deals with it, he very much invests himself psychologically in defending his friends about whom this sex scandal emerges because he identifies them with his marriage to Rachel. Another issue that Jackson has to face is the accusation that he's a traitor. And this goes back to 1806, 1805, 1806, when Aaron Burr, who, if you remember Aaron Burr, had stolen or tried to steal the election for Thomas Jefferson in 1800, a House election, um, had become Jefferson's vice president, and during the latter part of his vice presidency, had participated in a failed secession plot, and had also shot and killed one Alexander Hamilton. Again, you know, a few years ago, people laughed at Dick Cheney when he accidentally shot someone. Uh, Dick Cheney was no Aaron Burr, at least, right? In any case, Aaron Burr, once he leaves the vice presidency, he moves to what was called the Old Southwest at that point, which included Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, that area. And he decides to try another secession plot, to try to set up an independent empire, which would include some of the states already in existence in the United States. And he tries to solicit support from prominent people, including Andrew Jackson. Jackson does attempt to uh, support Aaron Burr because he believes Burr's story, that Burr is simply trying to defeat the Spanish, that all the military uh, weapons that he's trying to procure, all the boats, all the troops he's trying to gather, they're really just to defeat the Spanish. When Jackson figures out that Burr is actually doing something else, Jackson uh, writes to President Jefferson and tells him exactly what's going on. Fast forward 20 years, the Adams campaign turns 
Jackson's support of Burr's falsehood, his lies about what he was doing, into Jackson supporting this union, into Jackson being a traitor, even though Jefferson had acknowledged that Jackson had no part in this when he was president. But Jackson has to face the charge. Now Jackson's temper. Um, when you Google Andrew Jackson's temper, uh, again, lots of things pop up. But there are accounts on the internet, BuzzFeed, for example, in which people proclaim that Jackson fought a hundred duels. He killed dozens of men. Uh, he's almost Davy Crockett-like in his mythology. The reality is Jackson doesn't fight hundreds of duels. He fights basically two and a half uh, that we have accounts of. Um, he does kill some, one person in one of those duels. Uh, a man by the name of Charles Dickinson. Um, but Jackson has a violent temper in other ways. Uh, if you look at his personal correspondence, you will find that oftentimes he is very vociferous in his hatred of certain people and of certain groups. Um, and he hated lots of people in lots of groups. And this is very well known. In fact, if you look at the political cartoons during and after his presidency, oftentimes the anti-Jackson cartoonists will depict Jackson starting whatever he's about to say by saying, by the eternal. You know, this was sort of his, his exclamation that he often referred to. But in any case, during the 28 campaign, there was a concerted effort by the Adams campaign to focus on Jackson's violent temper. And so they pointed out his duels. They pointed out the fact that he had shot and killed Charles Dickinson in 1806, allegedly over saying something about Rachel's purity. Uh, it actually started over a horse race, again, Jackson's gambling. Um, they pointed out the fact that during the War of 1812, Jackson had ordered the court-martial of several soldiers who had deserted their post, or who had mutinied, or who had threatened to mutiny, or who had, in some other way, um, not fulfilled their military duty. They pointed out the fact that during Jackson's illegal and unconstitutional invasion of Spanish Florida in 1818, he had ordered the court martial and execution of two British nationals, causing an international furor and causing uh, a congressional furor in which Henry Clay, this is probably the seeds of Jackson's hatred of Clay, in which Henry Clay pronounced that Jackson was an, Amer an American Napoleon. <clears throat> so the Adams campaign has lots of ammunition to use against Jackson when it comes to his violent temper. And this coffin handbill that you see was one of the most prominent uh, displays of that attack. There are different variations of the coffin handbill, but what you see most prominently, of course, are the coffins. And that is to remind people that Jackson put people in coffins. And can we trust this man to lead our country? Can we trust someone with such a violent temper to lead our country? And again, if they had known what Jackson was saying in his personal correspondence, they would have simply confirmed their idea that this man doesn't belong uh, in the presidency. Another issue that historians have frequently overlooked that uh, I have found to be important, particularly in 1828, are accusations about Jackson's slave mastery. And these typically take two forms. One form is the accusation that Jackson was a slave trader. And the other form is the idea or the argument that Jackson mistreated his slaves. So let me deal with each of those briefly. The accusation that Jackson was a slave trader was prominent in Kentucky in particular and in Tennessee in 1827 and in 1828. And the focus was on Jackson's business dealings prior to the War of 1812. There was an instance in which Jackson partnered with a couple of other Nashvilleians to send a coffle of slaves down to New Orleans to be sold for profit. That slave coffle had made it to uh, Natchez, as far as Natchez, when one of the partners abandoned them there. And Jackson had to personally go and bring the slaves back to Nashville and sell them in Nashville. Well, this causes a furor at the time because Jackson gets into a kerfuffle with uh, one of the Indian agents who doesn't want Jackson to pass without demonstrating that he has, that he owns the slaves and he has passports for them and various other things. So it gains some attention at that point, but Jackson's not well known. But in 1827, Jackson is well known. And so his opponents dig up this, this slave coffle uh, and transaction that doesn't take place. 
and they make the argument that Jackson is a professional slave trader. Now, by definition, any slave owner was a slave trader. Right? You bought and you sold humans as property. But professional slave traders in this period were viewed with a certain amount of animosity. They were viewed as being a certain low immoral character. And Jackson is labeled with that uh, identity. And you have Kentucky newspapers, for example, who point out, do we really want someone who trafficked in human flesh to be our president? Jacksonians, by the way, are quick to point out that even though Adams was not a slave owner, Henry Clay was. And Jacksonians believed, frankly, that Clay was the, the puppet master pulling Adams' strings most of the time. So that was really what was important, at least in Kentucky and in Tennessee. So Jackson's slave trade, or is it the accusation that he was a slave trader, comes up in 27 and 28. And then in 27, there's also an incident on Jackson's Hermitage Plantation that gets into the national newspapers and then becomes prominent in 1828. And that is the death of one of Jackson's slaves, a man by the name of Gilbert. Gilbert was a frequent runaway from Jackson's Hermitage Plantation. There are at least three times that Gilbert runs away, is captured, and is brought back. The third time he runs away and is brought back, Jackson's overseer punishes him, or attempts to. He takes him out to the field, and he is going to whip him in front of the other slaves. Gilbert decides that enough is enough. He turns on the overseer, and there is an argument, there is a scuffle, and Gilbert is stabbed in the stomach, and he bleeds out dies. Again, this gets some attention uh, in the national newspapers, but it really doesn't become prominent until 1828. In 1828, Charles Henry Hammond, who had been a, a newspaper editor in Ohio who had talked a lot about, written a lot about the Jackson marriage, gets hold of this story and puts it into the national media. And you have this discussion about Jackson. Even though Jackson's not there, you know, he's not at the Hermitage when this takes place, there are these questions about his character. How can this man, who allows his overseer to treat his slaves this way, how can this man become president? How can we allow him to become president when the blood of that slave hasn't even been washed off of the, uh, off of the ground at the Hermitage? So again, the, the, the character or the personality or the image that you're getting of Jackson from the Adams press is of someone who simply can't be trusted. He has character flaws. These flaws should keep him from becoming president. And then finally in 1828, you have the accusation that Jackson, once again, perhaps, could become a traitor. And this is something that historians have completely overlooked. If you go to the newspapers in 1828, particularly in South Carolina, which, as you may know, becomes the nexus of nullification four years later. If you go to the South Carolina newspapers, and even in Mississippi and in Alabama, the other deep south states, what you will find is discussion of Jackson and disunion. If you go to the northern newspapers, you also see this discussion. Right? So there are two competing narratives here. One of the narratives, the one from the northern newspapers, is that if Jackson doesn't win the election, he's going to raise an army, he's going to march on Washington, and he's going to fulfill Clay's depiction of him as the American Napoleon. He'll, he'll perform a coup d'etat. In the southern newspapers, what you see is the image of Jackson. If he doesn't win the presidency, he's going to form an army, he's going to march on Washington, and he's going to form a coup d'etat. The northern perspective is, this is a bad thing. You know, this has to be stopped. From the southern perspective, this is a good thing. You know, we're tired of, of Adams controlling the presidency. We're tired of this man who used to be a Federalist and now says he's a Republican, yet he still acts like a Federalist. You know, we're tired of him being in charge. And frankly, if Jackson does take the army up to Washington, we're okay with that. And this narrative is particularly important, again, if you know what happens during Jackson's presidency. Because in 1832, when South Carolina nullifiers do attempt to nullify federal law, federal tariffs, in fact, and when they do threaten to secede from the Union if Jackson tries to enforce those laws, Jackson demonstrates very conclusively 
that he was not a secessionist, he was not a disunionist, he was someone who very firmly believed in the Union. And that is probably today his one saving grace for most Americans who study him. Uh, when you look at um, his personal character flaws, which again the Adams campaign highlight very effectively, uh, when you look at his treatment of Indians uh, during Indian removal, when you look at uh, his attack on the Second Bank and the consequences of that, it's hard to like Jackson. It's hard to find anything favorable about him. But one of the things that he does that is positive is he does keep the Union together in 1832-33. And in fact, when Abraham Lincoln, who was a Whig and then a Republican, and no fan of Jackson, when Abraham Lincoln was writing his first inaugural address, he looked at various Whig uh, state papers and, and precedents, but he also looked at Jackson's nullification proclamation, which took a stand against South Carolina in 1832-33. So even Abraham Lincoln, who again would not have had a beer with Jackson, um, sees value in Jackson. And I think he has a value for us today um, in some regard. So what can we learn about um, today's modern political campaigning from the 1828 campaign? Well, I think there are a couple of, couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, I think we should be thankful that however much we detest political campaigning nowadays, no matter how much politicians proclaim that the campaigning is too personal, uh, in reality, when you compare it to the 28 campaign, it's really not that bad. Um, you know, at times maybe it gets close, but it's really not that bad. Maybe it's that politicians today are better, I'm not sure. Um, maybe the second thing that we can take away from this is, I think, to hope that in 2016, that campaigning doesn't stoop to this level, right? That we can focus on issues and not on personality politics, that we can focus on the issues that matter to Americans today and not allow the distractions of, of attacks on character and attacks on personality and, and past events, whatever those may be, to allow us to miss the major issues and the candidate stances on major issues. And with that, I will conclude and see if you have any questions. All right, is there anybody who has a question out here? Any questions? And, uh, well, I've got one. Uh, good. So, uh, just over the you know last few years, especially most recently, we uh, went through a pretty seemed pretty long election cycle. Yeah. Um, so, how do you think that a little um, experience like this, a campaign like this, shaped us up against like let's say Mitt Romney, Obama, twenty uh, twelve? Um, how is it comparable? as far as the actual makeup of the campaign itself, as far as the mudslinging and so on? Uh, well, again, I, I think the mudslinging in 28 was far worse, um, obviously. But one thing about the 28 campaign that is uh, consequential for us even today is that is really where you start to see the origins of the modern political campaign. So the campaign buttons, some of the pomp and circumstance that go with campaigning, uh, parades and barbecues, that sort of thing, you start to see that emerge in 1828. Now, for presidential historians and political historians, 1840 sort of is the high mark of that during the antebellum period. That's when it emerges full blown. But you can see the beginnings of it in 1828. It's a very important campaign in that regard. And part of what happens in 32 and in 36 and thereafter is that you start to see the personality politics of the 28 campaign become the norm. So in 1840, for example, uh, when William Henry Harrison and the Whig Party, uh, who's the Whig Party candidate, when he runs, the Whigs focus on his military background and they focus on his democratic background. Uh, his military background, which was true, his democratic background, which was not. But they learned a lesson from 28. They learned that if you present your candidate as a military hero who's in touch with the people, then that is someone that people will vote for. And so the Whigs, out-democrated, if that's a word, the Democrats in 1840, and they defeated Mark Van Buren, who actually came from a fairly um, lower class background and was more of a Democrat in that regard, little d and big d, than William Henry Harrison ever was. But again, it came down to image and sort of the pomp and circumstance of the campaign. Do you have any other questions? Anyone? Go on right here. 
Uh, just uh, curious, nowadays it seems like there's so much special interest uh, financing for these uh, political campaigns that actually do end up attacking personal issues in the candidates' lives. I was just curious, back in this, these days, were there special interests that were financing the tax on, on uh, Quincy Adams, vice, vice versa? Uh, not in the way that we think of them today. There certainly are um, friends of Jackson who would like to see Adams out of office, but it's not necessarily to benefit financially. The one major exception of that would probably be newspaper editors. Um, newspaper editors were, again, sort of starting to come to the forefront during this period as shapers of public opinion. And so there is a sense among some of the pro-Jacksonian newspaper editors that if they can uh, get Jackson in office, he will work with Congress to get them funding. So there's that sort of special interest. And then there's also, of course, the belief among uh, some people that if Jackson becomes president, he's going to inaugurate this overhaul of government appointments, um, which I think historians have pretty conclusively decided was, was not quite as much as, as people in past decades thought. So when Jackson comes in, he certainly does replace some people, um, but he doesn't do so to any greater extent than previous presidents. Uh, and if I could clarify that for yeah. a second. Um, Jackson, on the other hand, does see, uh, after the 28 election, he does see special, special interest at work. So in particular, he looks at the Second Bank of the United States, which was a, a, an agency or a bank that, would, that had private funding and federal funding. And he learns that the bank president, or he believes that the bank president, because he's been told, was using bank money to fund John Quincy Adams in the 28 election. And that really prompts Jackson to attack the bank later in his presidency, because he believes that the bank should be a nonpartisan entity, because it has federal money as part of it. And when people tell him that it is funding Quincy Adams in 28, he believes them. And that sort of serves as the basis for him to attack the bank in uh, really 32 through 36. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us tonight. Um, I remember reading Robert Remini's uh, The Legacies of Andrew Jackson when I was in college. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts or comments on democracy and the chapter drive on democracy. And given there's you know, a lot of time, a lot of new material and research, and uh, you know, maybe was Jackson, could you say he was ahead of his time, at least with some of his thinking, his applications of democracy, uh, extension of the electorate relative to time so versus now? Right. So Bob Remini, who passed away last year, was a great uh, believer in Jacksonian democracy, the Jacksonian part of it in particular. I think a lot of historians nowadays see Jackson more as a beneficiary of democracy. In other words, he's not leading the charge for democracy. He's actually benefiting from the expansion of the electorate, the removal of suffrage restrictions in the states, uh, which makes sense if you think about it, that um, all of that is happening at the state level prior to, for the most part, prior to 28. Jackson doesn't have any hand in that democratization, but he certainly, as president, takes advantage of it. So during the bank war, for example, um, he is very clear that he is the direct representative of the people and that he is fighting for the people against the upper class. You know, that is a direct appeal to democracy. And the irony of it all is that Jackson is not a man of the people. He's a planter. By the time he dies, he owns around 160 slaves. He has multiple plantations. He is one of the wealthiest men in Tennessee. Um, and even his origins, his origins were not quite as common as people like to think either. So in some sense, I guess he is a man of the people early on in his life, but by the time he runs for the presidency, he certainly isn't. He is someone who is very much ensconced as part of the Southern elite. So in that regard, um, I differ with, with Dr. Remini, uh, even though he can't defend himself now. Um, I, think, I think he was wrong-headed about that. I think most historians today would agree that he was that Remedy was too uh, pro Jacksonian uh, democracy. Okay. You have one, sir? Mm -hmm. Do you have any observations on the role of the media then and as it has evolved to now in terms of being partisan advocates versus neutral 
purveyors of the truth. <laughs> uh, I will say that uh, newspapers in the earlier public antebellum period were very clear about their uh, where their support lay. Uh, they were partisan. They were openly partisan. There was no sense of of objectivity um, in, in almost every case. Uh, I think the difference today is that you have lots of media outlets who proclaim to be neutral, objective, et cetera, et cetera, on both sides of the aisle. And I think that you can find a lot of partisanship um, in those media outlets. So at least they were open back during the Jacksonian period. Today, I think there's a, a shroud of, of falsehood around a lot of those media outlets. So that would be my observation. Any questions on this side? Jackson really came across the person of the people, and he was going up against uh, Quincy Adams, who, as we know, came from a very elite family, and he had more money, or he ran more advertisements against Jackson, as you mentioned. He really attacked his personal character. And my question is, how do you think Jackson really went about prevailing over Adams and getting this message out there, despite the ongoing attacks that he had against him? Because he was very fervent in his defense, but it wasn't on the scale that Quincy Adams was attacking him. Right. So. Again, Jackson's campaign managers corralled him. Uh, and, and just remember that during this time, presidential candidates didn't go out and stump. Didn't go out and campaign. Um, they, well, they didn't always stay at home, but they were not, that was not something that you did. And so Jackson's campaign managers, whenever he would get, you know, the, the itch to write a nasty letter or to write a nasty editorial under his name, they would pull him back in and they would say, let us do it. So John Eaton, for example, who was, I think Jackson's best friend, uh, best male friend, uh, in 24 and 28, he really runs the campaign from Washington. And then he coordinates with uh, other campaign supporters in Nashville. And what they do is they form an alliance, a national alliance, that pulls in all sections of the country. So you have Jackson, who was part of what they called the West at that point, and seems considered the West by a lot of people. You have John C. Calhoun, in South Carolina who pulled in the Old South. And then you have Martin Van Buren in New York who pulled in the Mid-Atlantic states. Jacksonians simply, for the most part, rode off New England with the exception of New Hampshire because of Isaac Hill, who was a newspaper editor in Concord. Um, but in any case, I think the what made Jacksonians effective in 1828 was they had the National Coalition and they focused on the corrupt bargain. And I think that that message in an expanding, ele in an expanding electorate, I mean, even between 24 and 28, you had this massive expansion of the electorate where you have men who before had not had the right to vote, now have the right to vote. The Jacksonian message appeals to them that Adams is the elite Washington insider who's out of touch with the people, right? And you have Jackson who had served in the House, had served in the Senate for very short stints, but he was the outsider. He was the one who was going to come in and he was going to fix things. And that is the message that his campaign portrays, that he will come in and he will fix the problems. Um, and I think also the fact that Jackson has a very large southern base. Um, he sweeps the south in 28, and that enables him, along with pulling in some states in the mid-Atlantic, like Pennsylvania, uh, that allows him to win. He doesn't need to win. He can appeal to his constituents in the south, pull in supporters in the mid-Atlantic states, and that's all he really needed well, in the West, too. All right, we got time for about one more. One back. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Jackson had strong Southern support. I would assume Calhoun was a strong supporter. So after he goes to the nullification in 32, what happened to that Southern support, or what, it, what was the, the media uh, take on that? There's a long answer to that. I'll give you the short answer. Um, once Jackson becomes president, and Calhoun is his vice president, by the way, um, and Calhoun had been Adams as vice president. So imagine a sitting vice president who's actively working against. Well, uh, politics was much more complicated at times now. Um, so once Jackson becomes president, he receives word that Calhoun had not supported him during the invasion of Florida in 1818. Um, Calhoun had always sort of skirted that issue. So Jackson finds that out. 
Calhoun also winds up on the wrong side of that sex scandal I mentioned earlier. Um, Calhoun, there's there, there's some friends of Jackson who get married in some questionable circumstances, and Calhoun is identified with the anti-Jackson group, so that, that harms him. And then it becomes known fairly quickly that Calhoun had penned an essay in 1828 supporting the idea of nullification and secession. So the combination of those things put Calhoun in a bad light, and he and Jackson actually have a public media break in 1831 where they're writing letters, these long missives uh, in the newspapers accusing each other of various things. And so from 31 on, there really is no relationship between Jackson and Calhoun. By the time the 32 election is over, Calhoun is on his way back to South Carolina. He's going to resign the vice presidency, take part in the nullification of the movement. And so at that point, um, I think it's pretty clear that Jackson and Calhoun are done. The consequences of that are that in 1834, Calhoun and his supporters are part of the new Whig party that forms, which is an anti-Jackson party. So you have nullifiers, you have uh, anti Indian removal supporters, you have pro-bank supporters, you have reformers, moral reformers, all of whom sort of coalesce into this political party, and their one commonality, the thing that pulls them together, is that they all hate Jackson. There's really nothing else that keeps them together except they hate Jackson. And so I think one of the major consequences of Jackson's split with Calhoun is that it helps to form the Whigs. And in 36, when Van Buren runs for the presidency as Jackson's successor, he has to work very, very hard to keep the South in, on his side. And if the Whigs had run one candidate, I suspect that Van Buren would have lost. But Van Buren has to fight really hard to pull Southern votes in because people identify him with Jackson's lack of support for the South. And they also view Van Buren as a New Yorker, as a Yankee, as a Northerner, as someone who cannot fully support slavery and slave rights. And they, of course, that works against him as well. So there are lots of different permutations uh, of that Jackson-Calhoun relationship that really continue up until Jackson dies in 45. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you very much.